Coming from Washington, D.C. I'm Karen Donfried with GMF, and I am here with three wonderful panelists to talk about the morning after the U.S. election. And drum roll, please, we do not yet know who won. We are in a spot where President Trump has 213 votes in the Electoral College. Joe Biden has 238, and both of them are trying to get to the magic number of 270. But a lot did happen yesterday, and we have three terrific panelists to help us unpack what did happen. And I think the three panelists also show the incredible luck that GMF and the Atlantic Brücke have in terms of the people in our network. Let me introduce Heidi Heitkamp, who served in the US Senate as the first female Senator from North Dakota from 2013 to 2019. She has lots of experience in the state of North Dakota, having served as attorney general and also as the state's tax commissioner. And North Dakota is very interesting because it is a deeply red state, but of course, Senator Heitkamp is a Democrat. And in addition to all of those attributes, she is a trustee of GMF. So I'm delighted to have her with us. She is joined by Jim Colby, who also was a longtime member of the US Congress. He served in the House of Representatives for 22 years, having won 11 consecutive terms in the House. And after he left the House in 2007, we had the great joy of having Jim join GMF as a senior fellow. And of course, Arizona is a fascinating state in this election because it is a traditionally red state that flipped blue yesterday and supported Joe Biden. We also saw that one of the competitive Senate seats, the sitting Republican Senator lost to Mark Kelly, a Democrat. So it's great to have Jim with us. And last but definitely not least, we have Megan Kelly, who serves as the Director for Business Expansion Services at the Chamber of Commerce for Greater Philadelphia. And as all of you watching will know, Pennsylvania is a key state in this election and we don't know how the story is gonna end in Pennsylvania. And Megan is a 2016 Young Leader alumna of the Atlantic Brücke. So we are equally delighted to have Megan here. I want to encourage all of you listening to join the conversation by sending in your questions. And you can do that by using the chat function at the bottom of your Zoom screen. So I'm gonna begin by engaging our three panelists in conversation, but I'll keep an eye on that chat box and I'm very happy to include your questions as we move through our conversation. So with all that being said, let me first turn to Heidi and say, Heidi, what do you make of what happened yesterday? What is the state of play in this 2020 election? Well, I think the first thing you, that you have to say is that the polling that was done across the country and even the in-state polling was predictive of a blue wave. By that, I mean the Democrats were going to do very well, pick up anywhere from five to 10 uh, seats in the uh, additional seats in the House of Representatives, flip the Senate and win the presidency easily. That did not happen. Um, uh, needless to say, we're still in the process of, of figuring out um, who's going to be our president. Um, and and uh, the Senate, there's likely going to be a runoff in Georgia. Um, it's unclear yet whether Gary Peters, a, a Democratic incumbent, is going to be returned to the Senate um, in Michigan. Um, but other than that, it was a very good night for Republican senators, incumbent senators. Only two lost when they were predicting it, anywhere from four to, to five would lose. And um, uh, Mitch McConnell retains his majority. And so um, that means we are once again going to have divided government, in my opinion, divided government with a likely Democratic president as opposed to a Republican president. Um, let me kind of explain the dynamics of where we are right now. As Karen said, um, reliably read Arizona that has been trending more blue 
um, uh, actually went for Biden. We can all speculate on why that is. I like to give my friend Cindy McCain some credit and maybe think John McCain was um, pushing some buttons from beyond. Um, but I think clearly the friendship that the Bidens have with the McCains was a big factor, along with the fact that Arizona is a state that is in transition. We lost some very close races. And I think um, when, when North Carolina is finally called, I think it'll be a two point race. Um, and, and we are currently in a fight on a number of other very close races. So let me tell you, Nevada is very close, although that early vote is coming in now and it looks like it's going to trend um, to be a victory for Joe Biden. Arizona has been called by some media outlets. So that's another chunk of electoral votes. And it really now comes down to Wisconsin. Um, Wisconsin, uh, which was a uh, uh, Trump state in uh, 2016, today um, probably not without a recount, but um, probably will canvas and the canvas will show that, um, uh, that Joe Biden actually won uh, 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 Wisconsin. And I'll just kind of explain that where, where they thought they were gonna pick up votes was in Green Bay. They only netted about 4,000 votes and there's still a lot of votes out in the county called Kenosha. And so um, the speculation is that Joe Biden will win by probably anywhere from uh, 12 to about 20,000 votes, depending upon um, what comes in at the end. Um, Michigan, as we're speaking, uh, they're counting votes. Many of those votes are in the reliably blue area of Michigan, um, in the Detroit area and the Detroit suburbs. As we're speaking, Michigan has not fully counted all its votes and it has pulled ahead. Um, Biden has pulled ahead of, of um, Donald Trump in Michigan. That's just counting the ballots that are actually um, in the door right now. Pennsylvania is gonna take a little more time. Um, you know, the irony is people are saying, well, you've gotta count the votes on um, election day, the Republicans and the president in particular. Um, I want you all to understand that the Republicans went to court to prevent the, um, uh, the state of Pennsylvania from counting um, any day other than election day. So this is gonna, that, or, or uh, before any other day than election day. Um, that, that count was allowed, which is why Florida with the large mail-in vote actually um, uh, recovered. I think the big surprise of the night other than Arizona is Georgia. Um, I've long said that Georgia and Arizona are the next um, uh, Virginia. And by that, I know I'm talking to a very sophisticated audience that follows American politics. Um, uh, Virginia used to be very reliably red, not that long ago. And you see two states that have really trended um, in that direction to be, be the next state that was reliably red that now will be anywhere from uh, purple to a blue state. So now the question becomes, and I guess Karen, I'll, I'll kind of leave it at that as a recap of the election. But one of the things that, that I think is important to understand is what does a Biden administration look like in terms of dealing with a divided Congress? And so that's gonna be the big question everybody's gonna ask. Mm -hmm. Great, thanks so much. That's a wonderful way to set the stage. Uh, Jim, let me come to you. So Heidi is saying sort of in the surprise category, the polling turned out to be off again. The blue wave, blue wave was predicted, it didn't come. She also is saying the most likely outcome here is Joe Biden is president with a divided government. How does this look from where you sit, Jim? Well, uh, Heidi has covered very well the, uh, the, the, the outcome here, I think, of where we stand at the moment here. Uh, Arizona is reliably, is, I think we can safely say, is in the <clears throat> Biden uh, column. It's about 100,000 votes still <clears throat> remaining, or difference between them, and <clears throat> that won't change. Uh, yeah, Nevada, I think, will probably also stay. So you've got a pickup for in Arizona for Biden. You have one congressional rate seat in Nebraska where they count them separately by congressional districts that go is going for Biden. Uh, and he's ahead in Wisconsin. I think it's, I just talked to some of my Biden contacts uh, and they think it's, they're quite confident that Wisconsin is going to be in the Biden column, which means that uh, he only has to win Michigan or Pennsylvania, 
Pennsylvania looks a little more, more doubtful, Georgia. quite doubtful. Uh, but Michigan would put him over the top and, and get to the 270 that he, that he has to have there. Uh, but I think what this means, a couple of things there. Yes, Arizona is now trending towards a much more of a purple state. It's going to be very much a, in play in the future. Uh, the, a substantial pickup there now with two first time in 70 years, two Democratic senators uh, from the state of Arizona. Uh, you have another gain for the Democrats in the, in the, uh, Colorado, but a loss, of course, in Alabama, as was expected. I, I th a couple of comments that I would make, and one of them Heidi's already touched on it. The polling was way off again this year, despite the fact that the pollsters told us that they were making all these corrections to their methodology and that they were going to have this much more accurate uh, than before. We're off again on this. And I, it says something about the mood of the American people and what they're responding to or not saying and who's, who's turning out there. Uh, the other thing that I think that comes out very clearly from this election is that the American population, the public, is very, very divided still. We have a very divided country. Well, I think that a lot of people had hoped that there was going to be some kind of a sweep, that we'd get these last four divisive years behind us that isn't going to be the case. We're going to have a Democratic House, a Republican Senate, most almost certainly there, and probably a Democratic president. But it's not going to be, he's not going to be governing from <clears throat> a position of strength at, at all uh, in this. And it's a very divided country. That's a very ominous sign, I think, for our friends in Europe and our friends and anybody else around the world. We're not going to have the leadership role that I think that we would like to be able to say that we have, uh, but we'll just have to see how this thing is going to play out from here. But I, I, I am personally very discouraged and pessimistic about how we're going to get go forward from here because it looks to me like, regardless of whether the White House changes, it's almost the same as four more years of what we've had before in many cases. The Trump people will clearly be in command of the Republican party and they'll say they will you saw it last night at 2.15 when Trump spoke in that, I think, outrageous statement that he made that it's fraudulent, that his election's been stolen from him. Uh, that's going to be their theme. It's going to be their theme from now to December and possibly to January when this gets decided. And it's going to be a very divisive time that we're facing. It's not good. It's not good. And Jim, let me just ask you one follow on specifically about Arizona and from where you sit, what you see happening in Arizona. On the one hand, it's a, a state that has seen a lot of growth. And as new folks move to Arizona, the electorate has become more diverse. Heidi also pointed to the role Cindy McCain played in this election. What would you say is changing in Arizona that would explain the shift to the blue column? It's the demographics in the Phoenix area. You got to remember that uh, close to 70% of the vote is in Maricopa County, which is the largest county population wise in the United States. And that's Phoenix and the fifth largest city in the United States. And what's happened there is the growth there has been all these suburban areas around there. And I think these areas are quite different than the hardcore Republicans that we are, we're, we've been used to there. So I think it has changed. It's become Arizona is a quite urbanized state, despite the fact it's big and we've got a lot of open territory. It's a very urbanized state. And I think that that fact that you've got one giant population center in Arizona and that it's clearly trending because of the suburbs towards the Democrats, and this trend will, will continue. <clears throat> I think one of the other things I didn't say before that not too, so much in Arizona, but elsewhere around the country that has got to be extremely disappointing to the Biden camp is the outcome in the, uh, in the Hispanic vote. It did not turn out the way they had hoped. They hoped, thought they would try to get it better. And the looks like the African-American male vote is not as good as it, they had thought it would be. But clearly Florida, for example, went Democrat, went to, uh, or went, went to, to Trump because of the Venezuelan and Cuban vote in, in Dade County. All you had to do last night at the very beginning was look at the vote in Dade County and you knew this was not gonna come out well uh, for uh, the, the Democrats on this one. So I think that's one of the things that, that in Arizona, it does have a large Hispanic population, but it's different than you've got in Florida where you have this, the Cuban and the Venezuelan populations. 
Super, thanks. Megan, Heidi and Jim have both talked about some of the key voter groups that we've been watching in this election. Another one clearly is younger voters. And I'm curious what your perspective is on that next gen demographic. And also, of course, you know the state of Pennsylvania very well, and we've heard what a key state that is in this election. So Megan, over to you. Thanks, Karen. So as far as the, the younger demographic, um, you know, I guess you could consider me a millennial. I think I'm right on the edge. Uh, I feel old, but I guess it's nice to know that I'm still technically a millennial. Um, according to Pew, 59% of millennials are Democratic voters, while 32% are Republican. So clearly there is a strong, you know, a party affiliation mandate with this group. Um, and, you know, do I fit into that personally? No, not exactly. But I would like to, you know, give a little bit of perspective based on what I'm seeing, um, both in my professional capacity and in my personal capacity. Professionally, I work for an investment promotion agency within a business association. The Greater Philadelphia Chamber of Commerce represents approximately 4,000 companies, 650,000 employees throughout Southeast Pennsylvania, Southern New Jersey, and Northern Delaware. Um, and also a suburb, you know, a white suburban mom, right? And I think that that key demographic has been uh, highlighted over and over again in the analysis leading up to the election. So um, one, you know, one important dynamic here, I think, is suburban women. Um, this demographic actually helped Trump win Pennsylvania in 2016. But now we're in a situation where Biden is leading Trump by 14 percentage points among women and gaining allegiance with white college educated women who might have been voted Republican in the past. Why is that? Women are tired of Trump's bullying, the rhetoric, they're afraid of the example that he sets for their kids. Um, they're also feeling the impacts of coronavirus, having to deal with working from home while also being teachers and caretakers for their kids. Pennsylvania has been one of the states that has had more um, severe lockdowns in, in this country. Um, certainly this is true in Southeast Pennsylvania suburbs. Uh, voters in, in this area are, are more concerned with the spread of COVID than they are about damage to the economy. And a majority of voters believe that Biden is better equipped to curb the virus. But there's a paradox here. The same women who think Trump has done a poor job on the coronavirus and want him out of office are the same ones who are exhausted and outraged that their kids are not in school, who are writing angry letters every day to local school board and their governors asking for full reopening. As you know, Trump has been the reopening candidate, but that message doesn't seem to be resounding with these women the way you think it might in this circumstance. The reality, of course, is that lockdown measures, including school closures, is a matter of state regulation and Pennsylvania and New Jersey are democratic controlled. There's another key, uh, key group here that I think illustrates an important dynamic in Pennsylvania, um, that is energy workers. So Pennsylvania, as, as you may or may not know, is the leading producer of both shale gas and overall natural gas in the United States. Uh, the PA Department of Labor counts somewhere between 20,000 and 50,000 jobs in the natural gas industry. And you could add another 50,000 to that number if you count for ancillary jobs like engineering. Um, in recent years, Shell, uh, the multinational uh, company Shell Polymers invested several billion dollars in a plastics plant outside of Pittsburgh that converts ethane from fracking into ethylene, which is the building block to make plastics that go into bags and bottles and food packaging and toys and all of these things that consumers, of course, use. Um, they, this operation alone would produce 1.6 million metric tons of polyethylene per year, employ 6,000 construction workers, and would bring 600 new jobs to the region. This is not 
to, you know, this is not even counting all of the investment opportunity that could take place to grab in manufacturers who want to avail of that um, building block and then access the Northeast mega market where there's a large consumer base very easily. So it's no wonder that Joe Biden has walked back his repeated comments in the earlier part of the campaign that he would ban fracking. Um, on the other hand, and here's another paradox, uh, Franklin and Marshall College, a, it's a very reputable liberal arts college in Pennsylvania, did a poll that showed more registered voters in Pennsylvania support a ban on fracking than do not. So public opinion about fracking, interestingly, doesn't necessarily match the Commonwealth's economic dependency on the industry. Um, I think regardless of how far Biden and um, his running mate want to take the new Green Deal you know, proposals, um, the, the bottom line is there are a significant uh, number of fossil fuel workers in, in the Commonwealth who would have to be supported in some way by a transition to cleaner energy. Um, and so I think, you know, those, those two groups illustrate, I think, a lot of the, the shifting dynamics in, in the Commonwealth. Super. Thanks, Megan. And you mentioned the pandemic, which we haven't talked about much. And that clearly was the key issue in this election. And I know that a lot of our German and European friends are a bit mystified by why Americans are attracted to Donald Trump. And I think a lot of Germans wish they could vote in our election. And, you know, I just, I want to draw all of you out on this. And, and Heidi, let me start with you. I mean, you are sitting in a deeply red state. Um, there is clearly not a, an exhaustion with Donald Trump with the disruption. There's not, you know, the, the sense was this was a referendum on four years of Donald Trump almost 230,000 Americans have died of COVID-19. Help our listeners in Europe understand the enduring appeal of Donald Trump and what expectations would be of him on the American side for the coming four years. Why would you vote again for Donald Trump? I, I, I wanna talk a little bit about the coronavirus because I think people think they look at the death toll and they say the government should be doing more Donald Trump has effectively told them that the government is doing everything that it can and that we just have to go about and live our lives and um, until there's a vaccine and then this whole thing will go away. He used to say it would go away with the weather, but now he says, you know, when we get a vaccine and good thera th therapeutics, you know, there's nothing to worry about. That's a message that resonates with people. People want to get back to a normal life. And when your president is saying, don't worry about it, just go out there. Look what happened to me. I got it. I'm Superman. I wanted to put on a Superman t-shirt. Um, you know, so, you know, it, it's like telling your, your kids in high school, oh, don't worry about drinking. Just go ahead. You know, it's no big deal. You know, do what you want. And, you know, I'm not equating the American public with teenagers, but I think, I think that they have given... That Donald Trump gave uh, many, many people in our country permission to handle this virus in a very careless and dangerous way. And you can see the results. And then he, then, then people say, well, you know, I knew what I was getting into. So-and-so got it and she didn't die. Um, and so I think what you need to understand is a couple dynamics. Um, you know, for in, in the previous administration, there was kind of a hyper- attention to something we call political correctness. You know, um, making sure that you don't insult anyone, you know, a lot of talk about the cancer, uh, the cancel culture. And, and Donald Trump comes and says whatever he wants. Now, that, that the big flag in, in uh, my part of the world and really across, across the whole country, when you ask people why they're voting for Donald Trump, because he tells it the way it is, there's no bullshit. And, and that no bullshit became a major flag um, uh, for, for Trump's reelection. And so just understand, Trump is not, is not leading this. He's, he's basically giving permission to people to say whatever they want, do whatever they want, um, and, and handle the virus however they want. Um, and so you can say, well, that, that's pretty clever because we all want to, we all want, you know, a parent who lets us do whatever we want. But 
it's not leadership. And, and you, then, then the, the, the flip side is then there's that muscular thing that he does, which is almost a machismo, which, which I might argue uh, is why we have this, um, uh, this incredible gender gap. You know, there is also, we talk about red and blue, but people talk about the Republican party as the daddy party and the um, Democratic party as the mommy party. And the mommy has got to be kind of the, the one laying down the law and the dad's, you know, the fun guy. And, and so I, I, would just, I would just say that there is a, there is a dynamic. When, when, if Trump had gone out and said, wear masks, I'm not sure they would have followed him on that. He went out and said what they wanted to hear. He goes out and says what they want to hear and then says it in a way that people think, yeah, he's, he's really, really telling the truth. And, you know, it works with some people. Obviously, he expanded his base, um, which should frighten us all. He actually got more votes in very many locations. There was this argument about shy Trump voters um, to pollsters. And I thought, well, they don't exist. Well, trust me, they existed. And they came out and voted in droves. Um, and, and so I, I think you can't, you can't um, oversimplify kind of the attraction that people have to Trump by simply saying, you know, he's, he's, uh, he's a Svengali or he is, you know, uh, uh, Rasputin where he leads them. Uh, he, he's pretty good at hearing the tune and, and getting in front with, uh, with the baton and, and uh, leading the, the parade. So I think, I think that's, and, and that's something that bodes very poorly for the future of our country. You know, it's a really interesting point, Heidi, that President Trump was able to bring new voters to the polls. And he successfully expanded his base by essentially doubling down on his message. He didn't try to become more moderate. He didn't try to reach out to independent voters. And um, Jim, I want to pick up on a point you made earlier. You said, even if Trump loses, so let's assume that there is a President Joe Biden, divided government. You said, in that circumstance, Trump will remain in control of the Republican Party. And I'd love you to talk more about how you see the Republican Party developing. Well, I, I think there's, there is an effort going to be made to try to reverse the Republican, change the Republican Party to get it back onto <clears throat> some of its, excuse me, some of its fundamental principles back to the mainstream. But I think the fact that uh, Trump won so handily among Republicans, so largely among Republicans, it came so close to winning, if indeed that is the outcome, is I think it will be, and I really want to come back to that again. Uh, there will be an effort being made. I'm part of a group called Repair, which is uh, trying to restore the Republican parties to its fundamental underlying principles. I'm just not sure that that's going to be how successful that will be because the Trump people are clearly in control of the machinery of the party in virtually all the states. So if they decide that it's important to maintain that, as I think they might in order to run Donald Trump again in four years or Donald Trump Jr., in four years or somebody else like that, uh, then I think they will try to maintain that control of that machinery. They're not just gonna pack up and go back to the Trump Tower in New York there. But I think that one of the things that we've got to keep our eye on right now is the fact that this election well, isn't over. I, I think it looks very good for Biden because I, Wisconsin's going to go for Biden. And I, then you have Pennsylvania, Michigan looks likely to me and that does it but you also have Pennsylvania and certainly Georgia still in play there. So I think it's fairly likely, but uh, Trump isn't gonna go away between now and January 20th. He's already declared, he thought he was the winner. They should stop counting the votes in these other states. Of course, they should keep counting in Arizona but, so he could maybe win there, but they should stop counting in the other states there. And he's going to try to claim that this is fraudulent. And there, there is a serious possibility of tremendous disruption. I just hope that this isn't the, the case, that everybody stays calm. But I think that we really don't know what's going to happen between now and December when the Electoral College votes and January when Congress votes to count those. And then January 20th, when the president gets sworn in, 
we have several key things that have to happen between now and then in order for this to come out smoothly. And you have somebody who's the great disruptor who's going to be trying to do make that happen. So Karen, can I just add yeah. a, can I can I just add a point? And it goes to my point about about being kind of the fun guy who lets you do whatever you want. You know, the Republican Party has always been the party of fiscal discipline. Um, one of the things that Trump has done is just throw money in the air at whoever whoever his buddies are, and and um, has totally abandoned fiscal discipline, and and it makes no bones about it. You know, and and so it it, it fits with that narrative of. Where does the party of fiscal responsibility and free trade, where do, where do those people go? Mm -hmm. And Heidi, I also want to draw you out on the, you know, we're focusing here on the future of the Republican Party. There are also big questions about the future of the Democratic Party. If Biden has what would be called a skinny win in the Electoral College, it could well be that many on the left of the Democratic Party say, okay, we went with a moderate candidate and we didn't see the blue wave that was being predicted. So we need to double down and move to the left. Heidi, what do you think the stresses and strains in the Democratic Party will be? I think that would have been a lot more prevalent if Biden loses, let's just say it that way. If Biden loses, there will be, I mean, the, the, the post-mortem on this will be, that Biden never could win. We needed to nominate a progressive who had new ideas who could energize young people. And, and um, that's, that's where we failed, not getting uh, younger uh, uh, Hispanics and uh, African-Americans to the polls. Um, you know, there's an old, Karen, there's an old saying, you know, what do you call uh, some, a law student who got a C and passes the bar exam? You call him a lawyer. And so no matter, no matter what happens, um, if Joe Biden becomes president, you'll call him president. And that will not be seen as a loss. That will be seen as um, something that was so important that we get done. There'll be arguments that, you know, Elizabeth Warren could have done better here or there. But, but I think at the end of the day, there was a reason why Donald Trump um, did what he did with Biden and, and Ukraine. Um, and, and, and so he knew that this was potentially the one person who could in fact um, beat him. And so I, I think then it becomes, what, what does Biden get done? What are his, his policies? And there will be, mark my words, again, you know, this idea that Article I should be reestablished, that the branch that we served in, you know, the Senate and the House should be the dominant branch setting policy. What Donald Trump has done for four years is issue executive orders, make decisions, spend money however he wants to spend it, diverting money from military construction to the wall, <laughs> you, know, you name it. And, and so, so my point would be that there'll be tremendous pressure on Joe Biden, who is an institutionalist fundamentally, to use all manner of power the way Donald Trump did of the executive to um, move a more progressive agenda. Super, and Megan, let me bring you with it, in on this, the future of the Republican Party, the future of the Democratic Party, the deep roots of, of Trumpism in the US. What do you think? Yeah, I think, to, I think uh, the others here on the panel described very well, I think the, the shifts and the scenarios in the party, um, in the parties. And I think, you know, to get back to your question uh, about, what is it about Donald Trump's appeal that perhaps Europeans don't get? And I, I totally um, appreciate this question because I have a lot of friends and family in Europe and they think that, you know, we're crazy and that Trump is a monster and how on earth could we ever vote for him? And I, 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 there's one, I mean, there are many, you know, many things that Trump has done that I think a, a lot of folks looking at his policies objectively could say is a good thing for America. You take his personality out of it, right? Um, especially, I think, with regards to some policies that have helped the, the economy kind of get get moving in the earlier part of his administration. Um, but I think the, the biggest thing that I hear from uh, my American friends and family and colleagues is that it's not so much that Republican voters are drawn to Trump per se, it's that they don't 
they can't stand the illiberal elements coming from the left. And so it's more of a vote against left-wing policies than it is a vote for Trump. Now I live in the Northeast, so it's a really different, you know, a really different scenario from what you might find in the Midwest, where there are genuine Trump supporters who really believe in what he's doing and stand for him and his style and all of his baggage. But there are things that are, you know, concerning, I think, Republicans and conservative minded or even moderate people like, you know, the media, media bias, uh, cancel culture, a loss of freedom of speech. I mean, you can evidence of this is that the polls are way off, right? I mean, it, people are almost embarrassed to admit to a pollster that they're going to vote for Trump. I can, I can speak from personal experience and say, yeah, I, you know, I have been very shy to speak up about my political views because I am a conservative, right? And, and especially in a younger demographic, that's not socially acceptable. So it seems that there's this loss of debate, there's loss of speech, there, you know, see censorship happening to an extent on social media. And I think that's a really big concern for people who value liberalism, actually. So I now wanted to move the conversation to focus on the congressional piece just for a little bit. And we've got a lot of questions in the chat, bo chat box. And one of them actually is about the role of the Senate. So Heidi, I may start with you on this, but the very specific question that one of our listeners has is, and this is from Ambassador Heinrich Kraft, who's saying, Biden has declared that he wants to put the US back into the Paris Climate Agreement. And of course, it is today that the US officially leaves that Paris Climate Accord. And the question is, could he do this without the backing of the Senate? Would he dare to do it again with an executive agreement the way Obama did? Um, or does he need the Senate on other issues? So he needs to be more careful about how he re-enters Paris. And in general, what does this mean for US policy with regard to the climate crisis? Um, Barack Obama pur purposely did not ask for Senate approval of the Paris Agreement. Um, Biden won't either. Uh, and when people say, well, you can't get us into the agreement, you say, well, he got us out. And so, you know, it's back and forth. And it goes back to my, di my discussion, which is that you're going to see Biden getting tremendous pressure, whether he succumbs to it or not, tremendous pressure to bypass the Congress and do as much as what he can by executive order, and then dare Republicans to complain given all of the executive orders and all the, the um, uh, incredible uh, liberties that um, Donald Trump took with the, fisc, with the public fisc and with regulatory responsibilities. And so what I think you're gonna see is, is Biden starting out um, kind of uh, probably with the COVID plan. Um, I think Biden is smart enough to engage at different levels of government. And this is, this is where our federalist uh, system, not our republic or our democracy, but our system of federalism is so important, which is um, there are many governors who care deeply about climate. Um, and many of them represent very large states. And as the population becomes more concerned about climate, whether it's in Florida or someplace else, it may be politically a very popular um, thing to do. And so I think, I think you're gonna see um, Biden uh, working around Congress, not just with executive orders, but convening governors on things like COVID, convening governors on things like infrastructure, and that letting govern the governors, especially the, the red state governors, um, uh, really lobby their senators and, you know, because those governors want a political win too. And so I think that on infrastructure and to some degree, coronavirus uh, restrictions and controls, and I think on, on, um, on uh, climate, you're going to see an engagement with um, subnational governments um, in a way that uh, Trump never did because his bent is always autocracy. I alone can do it. Um, where I think Biden is going to look for allies in non traditional places. Interesting. Jim or Megan, did either of you want to comment on this? 
Well, I just say that I, uh, Heidi's right that he can do it by executive order. I, I think that if he does it, he'll downplay it. I'm talking about going back into the Paris Accord because he's got some big fish to fry. And we know that the Paris Accord, while it's a great statement of principles, doesn't have any enforcement in it. There's no real standards that are set in it. It really doesn't accomplish an awful lot. So I don't think he's going to break a lot of picks of shovels on that on that particular issue. He's got other things he's going to find are more important that he's got to spend some time on. But he can do it by executive order. And I think he will, since he committed to doing it, I think he's likely to go ahead and do it. And Jim, let's stay with you for a minute. And I'm interested in Heidi and Megan's views on this as well. But we have a question from Ryan Taylor asking, does either party try to become a national party again, or do they feel like they even need to? Do Democrats write off rural places? Do Trump and Republicans continue to discount Democratic cities or Democrat states and drive the wedges deeper? Jim, what do you think? I think that this election shows that the division is going to continue is only been exaggerated or exacerbated. Uh, so that I think this kind of division that we see in the country is more profound now than it was before, at least, or it's been confirmed from the last election, how profound this is. So yes, I think you're going to see this heavily democratic West Coast and Northeast and the heartland being very different with the fighting over these industrial states that we saw uh, last night. But I think that it's going to be a more, a more divided country than we've seen before. It's not gonna, it's not gonna be unified. Heidi, you're a Democrat who won in a deeply red state. Does that ring true to you? I, you know, it's, it's interesting. I, I've been teaching a course at Brown and uh, the last one of my seminars was about how do, you, how do you unite the country? And I did a lot of reading, um, which is kind of fun for me because it's been a while since I've had the luxury of, of really thinking about it. And there's a great Brookings piece about um, how Democrats see the world uh, vertically unequal and Republicans see it as horizontally unequal. Um, and and it's, it's interesting that naturally I kind of came to this, what's happening in rural America. You know, rural America used to vote Democratic. Um, and that was because of FDR and all the New Deal programs and, and the things that, um, you know, cons conservation and rural electrification. And I can go to the, all of the infrastructure that was really designed by Democrats and delivered to rural America. Mm -hmm. um, rural America has become reliably red. And so I started an organization and I didn't call it the rural project. I called it one country because I think that if we can deal with that horizontal inequality, what they see as inequality, what they see as disrespect, I think we can begin to heal the country, but we can't do it without the population, without the populace beginning to uh, stop pointing fingers. I was just on Squawk Box this morning and it was, it was like, see, you know, the middle of the country we delivered and look, you know, why do you people look down on me? And I kind of said, why do you look down on people in California? Um, you know, they, they, it's like, like they're demonizing, they don't even appreciate that where they feel disrespected, they're really disrespecting people in, in the coast and, and in the Northeast. Um, and, and so I think, I think that there has to be a dialogue outside of politics. Um, we funded a, a Sister Simone of the famous Nuns on the Bus uh, uh, variety and she went all around and spent a lot of time talking to rural America and if you're interested in her report it's linked on onecountryproject.org um, read it I mean it's just wonderful insights and what was great about that is because she's a Catholic nun um, people saw her as a spiritual person didn't see her as an atheist or somebody who was going they didn't believe in God um, and and so they were much more open with her and much more willing to sit down and visit with her um, there's, there's a number of projects going on right now. Um, uh, Cornell is starting a project to try and build out that kind of grassroots understanding that hopefully will change politics. We cannot expect the t this to be top down. We cannot expect that our leaders, you know, Joe Biden can't heal the country until we stop yelling at each other. And, and so um, 
the, the, the really important part here is that we all have to do our part and we all have to listen, you know, kind of like Megan says, she feels like she can't speak. Uh, Megan, you know, you might, you might understand this. When I was in the Democratic caucus talking about energy jobs, I, I, I mean, you know, I was uh, persona non grata. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, people have to learn to listen. Yeah, Maybe. absolutely. I, I would just, you know, only to add to all those great points that it, it seems as though our country has lost decorum and it's very regrettable. There's, you know, a, a day that's kind of lost when folks could have a debate and debate respectfully and d discuss ideas and, and not just fire insults or bring claims without proof, which seems to be so common now especially with the, the rise of social media kind of dominating our thoughts and our lives. People feeling that they can say whatever they want behind a screen and, that, and it's okay. Um, so I think, you know, how do you get that back is, is the million dollar question. Of course, uh, it, it does start from the top and, you know, leaders, leaders should be able to inspire us to, um, use decorum when we engage politically. And unfortunately, um, I don't think our, our current president has done a very good job of that. And we have a couple of folks who are interested in some other aspects about how we got to where we are today. Um, one is asking us to explain in greater detail why the public opinion polls were so off. Was it these sort of silent Trump voters? Was it who those polls are reaching? And then another questioner wants to add to that your assessment of the role of traditional media on the election process and its potential outcome. And I would say, let's not just look at the traditional media, let's look at the media landscape broadly. But who wants to speak to either of those aspects, either why were the polls so off and what's the role the media played in the election? Well, I'll just jump in there and say very quickly, leave it to others to comment further on this. but. I, I think it would be a mistake to try and say now, right now, why the polls were off as they were. I think there's going to have to be a lot more study to find out why. We heard all the things during the campaign about how they had changed the methodology and why it was much more accurate this time. They clearly saw that two, four years ago, they failed to weight properly the uh, non-college uh, educated white males uh, in the country, and they they, they decided to wait for that. Uh, this time, they I don't know what they've missed, but they clearly have missed something in the polling there, and it's, it's not accurate. And I don't know that we can, we're going to ever see terribly accurate polling, perhaps, uh, that we once thought we could, could see. Uh, so I, don't, I just don't think we have the answer uh, to that right now. Megan, Heidi, you want to jump in on either point? Karen, can you repeat the other point? About the role of the media. Oh, oh the role of the um, media. Yeah, I, what, what I would say is you are dealing with a cohort of people who feel disrespected and feel like they're not getting a fair shake in life. And then you have the grievance president who says, look how terrible they are to me. Look how they talk to me. Look, look. And so they, they feel camaraderie. Um, and so I think the mainstream media um, uh, were, were rightfully corrective of his untruths and his uh, extra kind of uh, judicial uh, uh, activities, whether it was transferring money or, or you know, talking to world leaders in ways that we've never talked to him before. Um, and so there was all this outrage and, and um, by, by the media and that, that outrage grew and grew and grew and it victimized Donald Trump and made him more of an outsider. And I think that that outsider, you know, he's just like us. He's nothing like the people who voted for him, but yet they feel this kinship to him because, you know, there's people who are out to get him and they don't like him because he says it the way it is. And that's, that, that's why he's my guy. Um, and, and so I think, I think that, they have to kind of, I, I think they overcorrected from 16 where they basically let him um, have hours and hours of free media by, by showing in real time his rallies and, and you know, kind of giving him more airspace. 
And then they tried to correct by saying, now we're going to hold them accountable in the media. And it just looked like they were trying to get even. And, and I, think, I think the media coverage um, backfired. Now, ironically, for people who aren't following North or following American politics that closely, um, right now, today, the, the, the media outlet that Donald Trump is most furious with is Fox News because Fox News called Arizona for Biden um, before Trump thought they should. And so Trump thinks that slowed the momentum, took away part of his argument that he actually won the election, and that's why he's mad at Fox News. Fox News. Megan, did you want to comment about the polls or the media? Yeah, so I think, I mean, I, I don't have, you know, scientific proof of this, but I do think that there's something to be said for the, you know, shy Trump voter who, who won't admit even out loud to a pollster that he or she doesn't even know that they might vote Trump. Uh, I think there's a lot of paranoia to out there and maybe conspiracy theories about, you know, somebody losing their job or, you know, being in trouble, you know, in their community if, if it, the word gets out that they voted for Trump. I mean, there's, it's a strange, it's a strange thing, but it's, a, there's a real paranoia there. Um, I, I think that was, you know, something that occurred the last time as well, um, where the polls had predicted a Clinton victory and then Trump himself was even shocked, I think, to see that he had won the election. Um, on the media, I mean, it's, I, I think it's, it's troubling to see what, you know, what's going on with the media. I saw a, a Gallup poll recently that said 84% um, of Americans believe that the news media is very important, important for a functioning democracy, yet significantly nearly half believe the media is very biased and um, even uh, three quarters believe that the owner of a media outlet influences coverage. So that's a, that's a big problem um, for the functioning of a democracy. If, if that's such an important piece of how we make decisions and, and feel that we're you know on good footing and it's there's so much distrust and cynicism about it, um, I think it leads us to a, a bigger crisis of, you know, democracy, really. I don't know how to, yeah, I certainly don't have any solutions on how to fix it, but I know that it is a, a big problem. You know, Karen, yeah. you go ahead, Jim. No, no, I'm sorry. Right. I was just I, I was, waiting for I the was next just going to say, you know, we've never had greater access to primary sources, mm -hmm. right? So you don't have to rely on the media if you want to know what the GDP is. You just go out and look on the, the Fed page. You know, Fred at the St. Louis Fed does a great job. I mean, I could point to probably 20 great non-biased data-driven. We have lost the ability of critical thinking. Um, we've always had biased media. Always yellow journalism. I mean, go through the history of our country. We've always had biased media, but We've also really tried to encourage people to think critically and, and thinking critically requires that you understand how to use primary sources and make up your own mind. We're failing in the education system to give people the tools to really bypass the bias and really get to the information that they need to make, help make decisions on you know, what they're gonna ask their leaders for or how they're gonna you know, live their lives. So Heidi, I may stay with you because we have a couple questions that fit into the category of the way forward. Uh, we have one listener who wants to ask if any of you think that we could see violent protests erupt. If the count drags on, if there's frustration in the public, you've talked about how polarized Americans are. So one question about prospects for violence. And I should say here in Washington, DC, if you go downtown, lots of buildings are boarded up. So there clearly is concern about that in this city. And then there's a second question that also fits into this category of the way forward. And that's about the role of the Supreme Court going forward. Sylvia Hockenberg is saying, is it really possible that the Supreme Court could stop the counting of votes? 
Um, so Heidi, maybe as the resident lawyer on this panel, let's start with, you know, what do you see the role of the courts being going forward? And if you want to comment on violence, please do. Yeah. Um, you know, I. First off, I want to say there is a very high likelihood that in some circles there will be violence if Joe Biden is announced the, you know, presumptive um, uh, presidential nominee. Trump set it up last night. He, I mean, you know, that was a dog whistle and I was on ABC and I just, I mean, everybody's like analyzing it. Boy, this is unconstitutional, you know, and the Republicans are all going to jump in and stop it. And I'm like, all the Republicans won re-election because they hugged the president. So they aren't going to, I mean, the lesson they learned is be a good lapdog because it gets you petted and taken care of. But, but uh, I, think, I think that on the Supreme Court, pay attention to Roberts. Um, Roberts does not want to be the super legislative branch. Um, I think there's two cases that are coming up, never mind the election stuff. I think, I think that there's, it, you know, elections are state law. I think uh, uh, it's highly unlikely, I think, that they will come in and try and stop the, the vote count, at least if the vote count is done within a reasonable period of time. And they will let the, the, the challenge go through the state courts and the canvassing boards and do whatever. So, so put that aside, the election aside. I think that the most important thing I've witnessed in watching uh, Roberts, who now has really become the leader on the court, is that he's tired of having to decide DACA, which is the, the executive order that Obama signed that gave um, protections to undocumented children or undocumented citizens, or not citizens, but people here who were not, um, uh, who came as children. Um, th th I, I, it wouldn't surprise me if they eliminated the Affordable Care Act. And uh, Robert said, look, I'm not going to create the health care policy for you. That's on you. And I think there's, there's a certain amount of enabling that's going on um, by the courts deciding these cases. And I think Roberts is sick of it and saying, look, you, you got a whole Congress there. You're all supposed to get along and make these decisions. And I'm not going to make a, make a decision for you. So I think you're going to see them try and turf stuff back to Congress. That means we may be hopelessly deadlocked on things like DACA, immigration reform, um, uh, uh, I mean, the healthcare law. So I think it's very, very challenging going forward. Okay, Megan, any thoughts on either violence or the role of, of the courts? Um, I would just say, you know, the in terms of violence, you know, all I can say is I certainly hope not, right? You certainly hope that there won't be any more violence because it's the last thing our country needs. And um, I think that it, you know, it's, it's violence begets violence. And so if there is an outbreak here, there's probably going to be a counter attack there and it could just be an endless cycle. So I just hope that cooler heads prevail. Super. Jim? Yeah, I, I think the prospect of violence is very real. Uh, there was a, a, some work done before the election to war gain different scenarios of the outcome, and only the outcome of a Biden sweep, a massive Biden victory, did not result in violence. The others all did result in violence. And I think that, uh, that it's very likely, and certainly what he said last night was the dog whistle was the indication that we're not going to accept this result. So I'm very worried about that. I certainly hope that isn't the case. I hope calmness prevails and people will, will not do that, but I'm, I'm very worried about that. In response to what Heidi was saying, I, she's right about, I think, where the court wants to go uh, on this. But the problem, of course, has been that Congress has been so divided and un dysfunctional that they haven't been able to write uh, specific laws and they're, they're, it's the unspecificity of these laws that keep them coming to the courts, which is why the, the courts have become the legislative branch. They have to say, well, this is what we discern that Congress really must have meant from when they wrote this in a very vague way. And it's, it's up to Congress to write these in a much more, more specifically. This question of the Affordable Care Act could be taken care of by Congress. There's no question about it. But will they do it? I don't see it with the divided Congress that we have. I don't see that there's going to be anything to do that. So I, I just think that what we've seen over the last several years, not just under the Trump years, 
is a gradual erosion of the legislative powers and it's kind of transferred to the, uh, to the Supreme Court. Remember that before 1924, I believe, there had never even been a Senate hearing on a Supreme Court nominee. They just went directly to the floor and were, were confirmed there. So there was never any question about it because it wasn't seen as anything ideological at all. But this has been gradually changing over the years. And time is racing, so we need to close. But I want to close out with each of you giving me one sentence on what this means for our European allies. So let's go, Megan, Jim, Heidi. Megan, one sentence. Um, I think, well, <clears throat> let's say if there's a Biden presidency, I say uh, more of the same on NATO, Nord Stream 2, and trade. Okay, Jim. I would say that there will be a Biden victory and it still is going to mean that the United States will not be able to uh, accept or to uh, assume a real role of leadership in the world that we once had. Uh, we're going to continue to be a very divided country. Heidi. I, I'm, I'm in the minority. I think if it's a Biden victory, we see the beginnings of the re-engagement of the relationship, both NATO and our trade relationship with our allies as we tackle um, the challenges of China and Russia. I, I think one place where Biden is completely different than the current president, not on tariffs and trade, not on uh, you know uh, uh, some of the kind of Buy America stuff that we can talk about, but on engagement and on appreciating and understanding the value of, of our NATO relationships. Well, and if he doesn't, I, if he doesn't, John McCain will haunt him. <laughs> well, Heidi Heidkamp, Jim Colby, Megan Kelly, I learned a lot from this. Thank you three so much for getting up early and joining this conversation. Thank you to everybody who tuned in. There were wonderful questions. I'm sorry I didn't get through all of them, but we'll all stay tuned and see how this ends. So onward and hopefully upward. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Thank you, everybody. Bye -bye.